turn. I think everybody in this auditorium appreciates that the remarks we've shared this afternoon are but a sampling of the many contributions you've made here at UT Southwestern and highlight the dimensions of uh, the contribution and the impact which will last uh, for generations to come. On behalf of everybody here and everybody at this medical center, I want to thank you for all that you've accomplished. I want to add my personal thanks because as has been highlighted by uh, a number of the speakers, I am one of the most fortunate beneficiaries of the foundations that you've laid here in taking on uh, this new role and joining this outstanding institution and wonderful uh, community. On behalf of everybody here, uh, in commemorating this day, we'd like you to have this rendering done by Lou Calver, an associate professor in the graduate program of biomedical communications, which we hope in some way captures all of the dimensions of the career uh, which we've heard so appropriately uh, praised uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, I can't begin to single out everybody who deserves special thanks. Uh, Don Selden, puffery is okay every now and then. Thank you. <laughs> this, this, is not a, this is not as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, I, I do have a few remarks and some slides I would like to show, but before that, there are some people that I will single out because unlike everybody else, there's only three of them, and that's my predecessors in the positions that I've held. Uh, Ron Estabrook was dean of the graduate school before me and laid a wonderful groundwork, and Fred Bonte was dean of the medical school before me and laid a wonderful groundwork, and Charlie Sprague was president before me and did the same, and I know all three of them, as I took over their jobs, had to bite their tongues a number of times to keep from telling me all the things I was doing wrong, but they managed to do so and were wonderful role models, and I'm very grateful to my predecessors, and I will be equally grateful to my successor and successors as well. Uh, I obviously have to mention uh, Jerry and Don Selden as mentors, and Ken Shine, whose recruitment to the UT system is one of the things I'm most proud of. But also, uh, I, I, as was mentioned briefly, uh, I would say a, with more emphasis that uh, all of whatever I might have been able to do would not have been possible uh, except for the fact that I married above my station and my wonderful wife Marnie was far greater than I ever deserved. Uh, and then we had the wonderful uh, good fortune to have two wonderful daughters who were beyond what we could have ever combined to expect and two sons-in-law who were almost worthy of them. <laughs> A brother that has uh, mentored and guided and been my wonderful friend, and five grandchildren who are perfect. <laughs> and so I want to thank all of them. Uh, and then in retiring, you know, you have lots of sort of reflections about uh, what what is it going to be like? Is it the right time to do it? What what do you do afterward? Uh, all sorts of times to look back on the, on on things and figure out uh, what, what is the meaning behind all this. So one of the things that you're aiming for is for people to say, why now rather than why not earlier? And fortunately, <laughs> not too many people have wondered why so late. Uh, but I looked around to see what other presidents had said and other people had uh, who were in a retirement mode uh, had to, what wisdom they had to share. And I came across a few things that I would like to share with you that explain some of the reasons why now I think is the right time for me to retire and uh, pass the torch to someone else and uh, uh, some of the sentiments that, that, that I share. And if we could move on to the next slide. Uh, do I control that here? Good. Uh, the retiring president of Brown University said that the job of the university president is uh, 
Not too difficult. You're expected to be an educator, to have at some time been a scholar, to have judgment about finance, to know something about construction, maintenance, and labor policy, to speak virtually continuously words that charm and never offend, to take bold positions with which no one will ever disagree, to consult everyone and follow all proffered advice, and to do everything through committees, but with great speed and without error. <laughs> that's, that's more or less what it's like. Now, when the president of Harvard University commented on what his uh, goals and, and, and life as a president were, he was uh, more brief. He said, our aspirations are modest. We aim to keep students and faculty sullen, but not mutinous. <laughs> We've had relatively few mutinies here. So. Uh, the president of Yale in 1962 said something that reflects a comment that uh, Ellen Viteta made, but it was true even in 1962, Ellen. Uh, the president of Yale said, we spend so much time justifying what we're doing, we, we don't have time to do what we're justifying. <laughs> And sometimes the administration feels a little bit like that. I did get a lot of uh, good advice uh, uh, from a variety of sources. Charlie Sprague was not one to offer advice. Uh, he held his tongue and sort of watched and um, sometimes I guess approved and sometimes probably knew it would have been better to do it another way. But the day that he was resigning and I was to take over, he did formally offer me one bit of advice. And some of you have heard this before. It's he said, there are times when someone will give you credit for something you don't deserve, and my advice is, take it. <laughs> there will damn sure be plenty of other times people blame you for something you don't deserve. <laughs> there was a, another time when somebody who was leaving office, uh, who I admired a great deal, uh, offered me the opportunity to spend an hour with them alone. It was uh, Lieutenant Governor Bob Bullock, who, as most of you know, was probably the most influential political leader in Texas through the 80s and 90s. And the a night before the last day of the 1997 legislative session, which was to be his last day to preside over the Senate, he had already announced that he would not seek re-election, uh, I spent an hour with him in his office uh, thinking that he would give me some sort of general overview of uh, what it's like to have lived such a, a fulfilling life as the, as the political leader in trying times. And he told me a number of things, but the one that stuck with me most was, he said, dealing with some of these people feels like being pecked to death by a flock of rubber ducks. <laughs> If, if any of you, and some of you know, Lieutenant Governor uh, Bullock was a patient here, so some of you know him, and I have to admit, I, this is not an exact quote. He didn't use the word people. He used it. <laughs> <laughs> he used a 13-letter word that time. <laughs> but when you really think about how important you are, uh, it's, it's good, I've found, to, to recall an anonymous poem, which I, has been one of my favorites for a long time. It goes, one day when you're feeling important, one day when your ego's in bloom, one day when you have the great feeling you're the most vital man in the room, take a bucket and fill it with water, put your hand in right up to the wrist, pull it out, and the hole that is left there is the sign of how much you'll be missed. <laughs> So uh, I have enjoyed this, uh, this ceremony. Thank you very much. It's uh, better than a funeral because I, <laughs> I, I get to go to the reception. <laughs>
how to retire uh, came from Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, who in his meditation said, thou has embarked, thou has made the voyage, thou art come to shore, get out. <laughs> and as for why to retire, uh, a New Yorker cartoon, I think, sort of captured my sentiment, and I will close with that, and thank you all for attending, and look forward to visiting with you downstairs.